Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how to use the newly announced EventBridge scheduler tool to create an event that fires at a specific time of the day. This is a really powerful new feature and previously people had to accomplish this using really weird ways like using a step functions wait task or build an entirely custom solution to accomplish this. This is so much easier now when you're using this new feature and I want to show you exactly how it works. All right, so in order to get started, the first thing we want to do is just head over to the event bridge section of the AWS console. That's where the new feature is located. So we're going to click on event bridge. And over on the left hand side here under scheduler is where you're going to want to go. So there's two things that we can do. The first is create a schedule, which is basically just an event that we're going to fire a little bit later on. And there's different types of schedules, which I'll explain in a moment. And then there's schedule groups, which are just ways for you to organize your schedules into kind of logical containers. They don't really serve any other purpose other than organization, as far as I can tell. All right, so we're going to click on schedules here, and this is going to bring us to the next page. This thing just tells you a little bit about the feature. You can use different types of integration. So you can invoke uh, SQS, SNS, Lambda, EventBridge as a result of these events. There's a whole bunch of things that you can read about here. I'm going to explain this to you as we go along. Um, so I already have a schedule that I created previously, but we're going to create a brand new one from scratch, and I'm going to walk you through the entire process. So go ahead and click on create schedule, and this is going to launch the wizard in which we're going to create our schedule. So one thing that I wanted to say is that the name schedule is a little bit confusing here. Schedule kind of makes me think like it's going to be a regularly occurring thing. And you can use that kind of configuration with this new feature. However, there's a specific type, which is called one time events, where you just create a single instance, that event will fire at a point that you specify, and then you just kind of throw away the schedule. So it's kind of ephemeral. Um, but the name schedule was just confusing at the start. And I wanted to clarify it for you here. Um, so for schedule name, you can call this whatever you want. Um, you can call this like demo or whatever. Um, and for description, you could put something in there. For schedule group, a default one is automatically provided for you. But if you want to put this in a special container uh, just to organize your schedules, you can do that as well. All right, so schedule pattern. This is really where things start getting interesting. So you have two types that are available to you. The first is a one-time schedule and the second is a recurring schedule. The one-time schedule is what we're going to use here. And this is like I was kind of alluding to where you just create an instance, it fires, and then you forget about it. Uh, the recurring schedule is as what you would imagine a recurring uh, kind of timer that'll trigger an event at a very periodic interval that you specify. So if we click on this, we can just see kind of what the options are available to us. Um, there's a cron based schedule where you specify a pattern. And with this, you can do interesting things like every Wednesday at midnight in January, trigger an event or every five minutes you can trigger an event. You can do some really sophisticated stuff with this cron job uh, type timer here. The other one rate based is a lot simpler in the sense that you just say like what's the value and what's the unit so minutes you can do like one minute five minutes whatever you want now some of you may be saying like cron based rate based this seems very familiar and you would be right there is an event bridge uh, rules concept that allows you to create a very similar concept to this using cron based or rate based to basically trigger an event now the distinction of this feature compared to event bridge rules is that you get access to a very powerful suite of features. So the first is that you get access to this flexible time window thing. And this thing, if you read it here, if you choose a flexible time window, scheduler invokes your schedule within the time that you specify. For example, if you choose 15 minutes, your schedule runs within 15 minutes after the schedule start time. So it's kind of like a range in which you can say, I want to trigger this within this time frame. And I think that they put this in to help deal Deal with bursty workloads as a result of these timers firing, but I'm not sure uh, specifically, but you can take a look at this and play with this. Um, you can do within 15 minutes, 30, four and whatever, but we're probably going to use off. Now, the other major, major feature of this um, new kind of event bridge scheduler uh, tool is that you can specify a start time and an end time for when you want this periodic event trigger to start happening and when you want it to end happening. Uh, previously with event, bridge, with event bridge rules, you couldn't do this. So it was always just going to be activated whenever you activate the event bridge rule. But with this, you can say start within this time frame and end within this time frame. Very, very powerful and very useful. 
Um, that's a little bit about this just thing, this feature in general. Let's get back to what we we're actually trying to do here, which is to create that one-time schedule. So let's select one-time schedule. And for date and time, I'm going to pick today. So today's the 13th. And what time is it? It's 11.25 for me, and I'm in UTC minus 5. So let's say, um, I don't know, 11.28 for this to fire. Uh, and this is AM. And flexible time window, we're going to use this as off. It only makes sense to use this as off for one-time schedules because you don't want any variance. Like you want this to fire precisely at this time. You know what? I'm going to make this 1130 because um, I may talk for a couple more minutes. And yeah, so I have five minutes until it starts to fire. Anyways, um, flexible time window, that is going to be off. We don't want that for one-time schedules because that defeats the entire purpose. One other thing I want to say is that you can only select or the minimum that you can select in terms of granularity is at the minute level. You can't say like 30 and 50 seconds, for example. It actually won't even let you. Like you, I can't type anything here. So one minute granularity is the minimum that you are able to do with this feature. All right, so we're, we're happy with this. Let's go ahead and click on next. By the way, you can select the time zone here if you want as well. Uh, we're gonna click on next now. And it's asking us, what do we want to integrate with? What do we want to actually invoke? So there's a whole bunch of things that you can do here. And the most popular ones are most definitely going to be Lambda, um, SNS, SQS, Step Functions, and EventBridge. And if these aren't like, the ones that you're going to use, you can click on all APIs here. This gives you like literally every API that you can interact with. So this can pretty much interact with any AWS service and any API. All right, I'm going to show you how to do this using SQS, um, but the process is exactly the same for any of these different options. So when you pick SQS, obviously we need to define the queue in which to send this. If I were to pick Lambda, it's going to ask us for the Lambda function. That's fine. Let's just go with SQS in this case so I can show you what the message looks like in the queue. Uh, we're going to click on that. There we go. So we need to select a queue now. I already have one that exists. I'm just going to select my temp queue here. And this is the cool thing as well with this feature. You can specify a specific payload that is going to be contained with this event when it gets fired. And the reason this is useful is like, say, for example, you have a use case where after a customer places an order, you want to send them a email notification or some kind of notification five days after they place that order. What you can do is you can register a timer for five days after that order is placed and then put in here, like this is the customer ID that this order is with reference to, right? Like maybe it's like one, two, three or something. And the reason this is useful is because when this event fires, do you need the context of why this event fired? What is this with respect to? If you don't put anything clever in here, you're just going to have events firing. You're not going to know what it's about. So make sure that you use this. This is another feature that's also not available with CloudWatch rules. With CloudWatch rules, you only get to specify static input. And so this allows you to be a little bit more, more dynamic with what goes into the payload of the event when it fires. All right, so we should be good there. Let's click on next. And another thing that you have access to is retry policies, very powerful. Um, oh, uh, we wanna leave this as enabled, obviously. Yeah, retry policies, it'll keep on retrying up to 24 hours by default, and it'll try 185 times. I'm not sure why this number is a thing, but it is. You can also specify a DLQ or a dead letter queue of where this event will go if it cannot deliver it to the target. So this is useful if you have like Lambda functions as your integration point. If your Lambda function is being throttled at the time that this event fires, Fires, it won't be able to invoke the Lambda function. It'll probably be fine because you have like a million retry attempts here. But if for whatever reason, like your function is permanently being throttled after a certain number of retries, it'll go into the DLQ. So you can use this if you really want. Just checking the time. Yeah, I have one more minute. All right, so let's go down now. Nothing really else to see here. It's going to create a new role for this schedule. That's fine. Click on next. This is asking us to confirm the details. That's fine as well. We're clicking on creating the schedule and we can see, uh, yeah, it's creating the schedule. We're at one of 12, just checking the time. We have one more minute. I hope this completes before or else we're gonna have to adjust the timer a little bit, uh, but I'll let you know when this is all done. All right, guys, so this is all done and I wanna go into the SQS section of the console now to verify that everything is working correctly. So I have another tab open for SQS. If you look here, you can see my temp queue now has one message available in it. And if we click on this and we pull the queue, send and receive messages, 
and where's poll yeah poll for messages here is our message you can see when it was sent approximately 11 30 at 44 seconds past don't be scared of this 44 seconds past i'm pretty sure this is because of my fault um i the it was very very close to when i created the event and it, like it was literally at 11 30 so i think it just picked it up right at the end of the minute here uh, but if you take a look at what's inside this message now, you can see exactly what we had. So customer ID one, two, three. So this feature is now available for you to start using EventBridge Scheduler, and it's going to make your life a whole lot easier if you need to schedule events that trigger at a particular time. If you like this video, check out this other one on comparing SQS, SNS, and EventBridge right here on the right. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.